Well, it is cold, it's icy, it's wet, it's slippery. I did a donut out of the driveway today. And guess what? This is the Lord that this is the day that the Lord has made and we should rejoice and be glad in it. First Sunday of Advent, you'll notice that I'm dressed a little differently and that is because um uh, usually, at this point, we would have the reef out, but if you are like me, this came a little bit quickly, it seemed like, this year. And so we'll, we'll get the reef out and, and light the candle starting next week, but um, normally I would have on my green shawl, which basically in the church calendar means nothing's going on. It's called ordinary time, which means we, we aren't celebrating anything specific. Um, but during Advent, you, we have specific colors, and, and the color for the next few weeks will be purple, because that purple represents royalty, because Advent means the coming or the beginning. And um, we at, in the church age, the age that we are in now, are in a unique position in that we look backwards at, at the first Advent, Christ's first coming, and we also look forward because we know that when he left to be with the Father that he promised that he would come again. So we're, we, we, we in a, we're in a dual position. We're looking backwards and we're also looking forwards. And so even in terms of preaching, I, I do things a little bit different. Um, I've got two books that maybe those of you who were raised in other traditions such as the uh, Lutheran tradition or the Catholic tradition or in some more conservative Methodist traditions you might recognize and that is the Revised Common Lectionary uh, which is the small version or the three volume lectionary which is this is one of three and during Advent and sometimes during Lent I like to preach out of the lectionary uh, when it comes to preaching, I always say that those that use this method, they've got it easy and they've got it hard. They've got it easy because when they go and sit down at their desk on Monday morning and prepare to preach, they've got text already because the lectionary gives you an Old Testament text, it gives you a psalm, a gospel, and a New, Te a New Testament reading. You just look at the four and you pick one. That's the easy part. The hard part is sometimes on some of those weeks, those readings, you're like, how in the world can I pull a sermon out of this? But I, I truly do believe while I am not a lectionary preacher, you all know I, I like to preach primarily from series, I do believe during this time of the year specifically, it is a good approach. And so I, so, and also if you were to purchase one of these, these are great study tools. It gives you stuff to read to study for each week. And so the text that I've chosen, I chose the Old Testament text for this week. It comes out of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, the, six, the 14th through the 16th verses. And the title that I chose is Hard Truths, Hopeful Promises. Hard Truths, Hopeful Promises. Now, if you look in your bulletin, that is the NIV version of this text. This morning, I decided as I looked at the different versions that I wanted to read from the New King James Version. So the text on the screen and the text that I read will be the New King James Version, but you can also follow along in your bulletin. Again, hard truths, hopeful promises. Jeremiah 33 Verses 14 through 16, I would ask that all who could would please stand in reverence to God's word. Behold, the day is coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem 
will dwell safely in the name by which she will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy and true word. You may be seated. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because when you look at the book of Jeremiah, which is a very long book, he didn't have a lot of positive things to say. As a matter of fact, he's probably one of those people that when you saw him coming, uh, you would have been like, oh, here comes Jeremiah again. What bad news does he have to bring today? And to add to that, we have to remember Jeremiah isn't talking to just the everyday Joe Smo. He's talking to the leadership of the nation of Judah. He's talking to priests. He's talking to the king. And he does not have a lot of good things to say. He's prophesizing that the nation will fall. He's prophesizing that the time will come when the nation is going to be carried in the captivity. He's prophesizing all of these doomsday prophecies. Now the king has other prophets. And those prophets are saying, oh, king, you don't have to worry about it. God's got our back. You know, because God always has our back. So we don't have to worry about what that old negative Nelly Jeremiah has to say. This is God's nation. It has God's temple in it. There is no way that God would ever allow his home to fall to a foreign power. So don't, don't, you know, don't worry about it, king. And then here comes Jeremiah saying, don't you believe it. Bad things are coming. And here's the thing about that. It's human nature. We don't like bad news. We don't like to hear negative things. Back when I was in high school, I, I um, participated in a play called The Wiz. Now, The Wiz was an adaptation of, uh, more of a musical adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. And I played the cowardly lion. Now, there was a very talented young lady. Uh, her name was Claritha. I think her last name was Jones. I'm not sure. But she played the wicked witch. And there's this scene in that play where the... Um, where one of her flying monkeys is coming to give a report to her and, and there's a song that goes along with it that she sings once the flying monkey gives her the report because the report is bad news and the song says, no bad news, no bad news, don't nobody bring me no bad news. Now, we're talking about the Wicked Witch of the West here, so it's probably a good idea not to bring her bad news. We're also, in Jeremiah's case, talking about the king of Israel a very powerful man in his own right, and Jeremiah has to bring him bad news. He has to speak truth to power and say, no, your kingdom will not last, your kingdom will not stand, and it's for various different reasons that that's going to happen. So people didn't like to see, they just really didn't like to see Jeremiah coming because they knew, here we go again with the bad news. But in addition to the bad news, in addition to the hard truth, which, which, which is what Jeremiah was prophesizing, the hard truth, this is what is going on, this is what is going to happen, he still had a message of hope. And that message of hope is what we are looking at here. He's saying all of these things are going to happen to Israel. But God is not abandoning Israel. He's saying, yes, God is removing his covering. He's removing his protection because for generations you have not done what you were supposed to do, but God will not leave you. He's saying that there's a day that is going to come when the Lord will perform a good thing for the house of Israel. And in those days, he will cause to grow up out of David a shoot that is righteous, that is good. Now, one thing you can follow when you, when you look at the Bible is the path of the kings. You, you had, first of all, you had a united Israel, and that Israel had King Saul, 
and then King David and then King Solomon and then the kingdom divides into two different kingdoms and when you read about the kings in the Bible usually very early there's a statement about how that king ruled it either says and that king did good in the eyes of the Lord that king served righteously in the eyes of the Lord or it'll say that king did evil in the eyes of the Lord that king did not serve righteously in the eyes of the Lord and unfortunately as we go down that list more often than not we hear that king did evil in the eyes of the Lord and so throughout its history there, there have been this line of just bad kings and every once in a while you throw a good one in there that does the right thing and then a line of bad kings and then you throw another good one in there he does but it's line after line in the current king Zedekiah is not a good king not only is he not a good king he's a weakling he's kind of snivelly I mean he he's not he's not a leader and and the interesting thing is his name, his name actually means the Lord is my righteousness. And what Jeremiah has been trying to do for the first 30 chapters here is say, hey king, live up to your name. And the king's like, yeah, no, 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 my prophets are telling me that, that you're full of it. I don't have to worry about it. God's got our back. And so you'll notice at the end, he sort of puts a play on the name and he says, the Lord is our righteousness. That's what this new king that will come out of David will be. And so at this point, even though the nation is going to go through this great calamity, what Jeremiah wants them to know is you have something to look forward to. Now, of course, at this point in their history, Jesus has not come. And, but what Jeremiah is prophesizing is that there will be a time when there will be a great and a righteous king who will sit on the throne of David. However, before that, things are going to get a little bit rough. And of course they did. The king gets taken into slavery. The nation of Judah is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. The people are taken into captivity in Babylon. They spend a time in Babylon. Eventually, some of them are allowed to return. And we, when you read the book of Ezra, you find that they rebuilt the temple. And there were two reactions to the rebuilding of the temple. For those that were young and had not seen the previous temple, they were excited. Wow, we relayed the foundation of the temple. We have achieved something. For those that were alive and saw the previous temple, there was weeping because they said, this is nowhere near the level of grandeur that the temple we had before was. So there was excitement and there was sorrow. But even now, even though they're allowed to return, there's still no king. And they go, and it's one nation after another that controls Israel. There's Babylon, there's Persia, there's Greece, there's Rome. There's a brief period in there where they're somewhat independent, but then the time of the Romans comes. And we know into that time, this Savior is born. This, this, this person that Jeremiah prophesied about, that he said, there will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the earth. And we know that that portion of the prophecy was fulfilled in the time that we are about to celebrate, the birth of Jesus Christ. So Jeremiah was giving the nation hard truths, but he was also giving them a hopeful promise that, yeah, you're going to go through some difficulties. You're going to go through some hard times, but God has not abandoned you. And I think that this message that Jeremiah was giving at that point in time is so relevant in the 21st century because we look around us we look at all the things that appear to be happening and either we want to deny it we say well you know what things are bad over there things are bad elsewhere but we're just fine here what that is called is that's called denial it's a river in Egypt or we focus so much on the difficulties that we forget about the promise or we forget about the joy that can and be obtained in this life. 
we look at just just the last month if we just look at the month of November it's it's been a difficult month in this world 900 people shot out of the sky in Sinai Egypt over 120 people in a music hall and a soccer venue and in shops and restaurants in Paris over a hundred people in a hotel in Mali and just two days ago five people one a police officer in a Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado Springs and you look at that and you say what is going on it's a hard truth that yes the world is a dangerous place yes there is evil and sadness and depravity in the world yes there is difficulty yes there is illness yes there is hardship yes there is a racial tension we look at Chicago just over the holiday as the tape of the police officer shooting that teenager 16 times is released there's racial unrest in Chicago yes all of this is happening in the world and it is time that we do we need a Jeremiah that speaks truth to power and says no everything is not all right there are difficulties but we must also remember the promise we must remember the promise there's sin in the world. And because of that, there is difficulty, there is hardship, there is sickness, there is illness, there is death. But just as the first part of this promise has been fulfilled in the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we must remember what he said in, to his disciples. He said that I am going away. But he made two promises. He said, I'm going away, but I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the comforter. That comforter is the Holy Spirit. And in, it is in the Holy Spirit that we as Christians can find our comfort. It is there, there that we can find our joy. It is there that we can find our peace. Peter said, be ready for an answer for the joy that we have that surpasses all understanding. And people will look and say, when the world is on fire, how is it that you Christians can find joy in that? And we know the answer. It's the comforter that Jesus Christ sent to us in the form of the Holy Spirit so that was his first promise and we have and we received that promise when we receive him as Lord and Savior that he would send his comforter and in that comforter we do find our joy we do find our peace we we do find a, an, an ability to say okay things are hard but one, we look around and we know that they're always worse for someone else. There's always someone else that needs our help. There's always someone else who is off on the side of the road with a flat tire that we can help. There's always someone else. And so we can find our joy and our comfort and our peace in our Holy Spirit. Second promise though, the second promise that Jesus made uh, when he went away, he said, I will come again. And so as we are in this Advent season looking backwards, we look backwards and we see that he fulfilled the first promise. He did come. He is that shoot that has grown out of David, that, that is sitting on the throne of David and has given us the ability to have salvation. But the second part of the prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. It says, for he will execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell safely and in and." And this is the name by which it shall be called the Lord is our righteousness. You see, he has not executed that judgment yet. He won't do that until he fulfills the second promise, which is, I will come again. So what do we have to look forward to when we look at the hard truths of the world? What do we have to look forward to when we look at the hard truths in our nation? What do we have to look forward to when we even look at the hard truths within our own families? The things that we may be dealing with in our own families, illnesses, relationship issues. I, I, my mother, for most of her life, was a very athletic person. Annoyingly athletic for someone who 
I was athletic, I just wasn't interested in the same sports that she was and she just couldn't understand why her son didn't want to play basketball. And I tried to explain to her because I want to play it like football. And they don't like that when you play basketball like football. But she was an excellent basketball player. She was a, a track star. She loved softball. And that was for most of her life, well into her 50s. And now she's legally blind. And people say, well, you know, how can she smile through that? Because she knows the promise. She knows the promise. How can I smile through that? I don't like having my mother in that condition, but I know the promise. I know who holds my future. I know who gives me peace. And so even in those hard truths within our own lives, we can find hope in the promise. And what is that? Well, we know the first half of the two-part story, that Jesus did indeed come, that he grew into manhood, and that he ministered on earth, and that he healed the blind, healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he raised the dead, and that eventually he went to the cross, and he went to that cross knowing what was ahead of him, knowing the pain, knowing the agony, knowing the sorrow, knowing what was going to happen as he hung on that cross, and you know what he said as he went? You are worth it. I say, well, what, who are you talking to? I'm talking to you. You are worth it. That's what he said. You are worth it to me. And we know that he did indeed die, and with that death, uh, salvation was granted. We also know that he rose on the third day, and that for a time he walked the earth, and he walked with his disciples, and he continued to teach, and eventually he ascended into heaven. We know that in the books of, book of Acts, it tells us that there was a day when they were gathered in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them like a mighty rushing wind. All of these are promises that have been fulfilled, grateful promises, glorious promises that have been fulfilled. We know that he said that I am going to come again. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house and I will return again. And so as we sit here in this Advent season, that is that what we wait for. That is what we look towards is that return. But don't just sit at home waiting on the return. Live life. Live life. Are there going to be bumps in the road? Yeah. And that doesn't matter. There are going to be bumps in the road for Christians. There are going to be bumps in the road for non-Christians. Are there going to be difficulties? Yes. Are there going to be hardships? Yes. That's all a part of life. But we have two things, we should have two things that can help us to deal with those hardships in life. We have the promise of our Lord and Savior, we have the Holy Spirit, but we should also have each other. When we talk about family, we must remember as Christians that family is extended beyond blood. We are family. We should be able to lean on and depend on each other and to see each other through those difficulties, through those hardships as well. No Christian should ever deal with the hardships of life alone. Because they have brothers and sisters. Amen? So on this first Sunday of Advent, a Sunday that represents longing and awaiting for the coming of the King, we do not deny anything. We admit that when we look back at 2015, it was a rough year for the world in general. We admit that, but we can still find joy because we also know that there's a Holy Spirit in us, that there is a risen Savior, and God is still on the throne. And we look forward to the fulfillment of his hopeful promise of his return. Amen? Let's pray.